Well, I wonder if you're ready to hear the word tonight. I am too. Amen. So let's give a let's give a praise to our Jesus, and also let's welcome our, our very own uh, Reverend Rick Rogers to the platform. Hallelujah. Well, praise God. It's good to be in his house tonight. Amen. God is so good. God is doing some awesome things here at Res Life, and, and we get to be part of it. And that's the most exciting thing is we get to be part of what God is doing. So I'm just really stoked about it. Hey, uh, uh, if you came in tonight and, or you maybe stuck in before we were back there, once again, I have outlines that I like to use when I'm ministering. If anybody did not get one, just raise your hand. The ushers do have one. Just keep your hand raised until they come around. No, there's no test on this. I want you just to be able to take these home and, and study them. And maybe you're going like, well, Brother Rick, uh, I don't have a problem with what you're going to talk about tonight. That's fine, but you can help somebody else that may have a problem we're going to talk about here tonight. Because if you can look at the title, I'm missing the main word. <laughs> I think it went off my sheet or something there, but I didn't realize it until tonight. And I want to talk to you tonight about five conditions of answered prayer. Awesome. Answered prayer. I talked to many people that have pretty much given up on prayer. They say that God doesn't answer prayer. And these are people that have been around for a long time. And it, it bothers my heart when I hear them like, yeah, you know, I'll let somebody else pray because they, they seem to have more action than I do. And they get more response from God than I do. But one thing that's been burning my heart, and this for a few weeks now, that as I was praying to God about this, like, Lord, what do I need to speak to your people? And I'm not saying anybody here has a problem with receiving answered prayer, but maybe you know somebody who does. Or maybe in, maybe in the next few weeks, God's going to bring somebody along to you. You're going to go like, you know, I'm having a real problem here hearing from God and getting some answered prayer. And you can take this outline out and go like, you know what, let's sit down just for a moment here. Just get a cup of coffee and let's talk for a few minutes here and look at five points, maybe what's going on here. Why maybe God's not answering your prayers. Amen? Because we all at times in our life, we wonder, God, are you hearing me? God, it seems like the heavens are brass right now. God, are you there? And it seems like when he's the farthest away is when you need him the most. Amen. When you're in the middle of the storm, you're going like, Lord, are you not awake? Hello? I'm over here. I'm sinking financially. Or, oh, Lord, I'm over here. I'm sinking relationally. Lord, do you not hear me? And God is silent. Isn't that nice? <laughs> you know? And you begin to say, Lord, I know that you are God, and I'm going to trust you even though I don't hear you. I'm going to trust you because I know that you're here even though I cannot see your hand right now. And I know many of you here tonight are going through some things, some major storms right now, unsure of what's going to happen and what's going on. But can I tell you, stay in the boat. Unless he calls you out of the boat. But stay in the boat where it's safe. Stay on your knees. Stay on your knees no matter what it looks like and no matter what's happening. God is still in control. He's still in control, saints. Amen? Amen. And it's so good to know that he's still in control. So my question for you is, what is prayer? But I think we need to go to a deeper, a little bit deeper on that if we could and say, does God promise to answer every prayer request? The answer is no. The Bible is very clear that God does not answer all prayer. Because many of our prayers we're going to see here tonight are not even God's will. They're our will. They're our selfish desires. They're things that make us feel better about ourselves. They're not anything to help anybody else. We're going to look at some things here tonight. Five facts and five conditions for answered prayer. Anybody excited about hearing some reason maybe why your prayers are not being answered? Because I know this has been really been working in my spirit on some things also. So the very first thing, if you're taking notes here tonight, is if you want to have your prayers answered, some conditions in the Bible, the Bible is very clear that these conditions must be in place. It's not a formula. It's just some conditions that have to be in place in order for God to answer your prayers. And he wants to answer your prayers. He does. So the very first thing, if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. You must have an honest relationship to God. In other words, you got to know him as your personal Savior for one thing. In the same sense, you've got a relationship that you are with him. The Bible says in uh, John chapter 15, verse 7, it says, If you remain in me and my words remain in you, you can ask whatever you wish and it will be given to you. But saints, if anybody's around the Bible long enough or around the church long enough, you know with every promise, there is a premise. With every promise that God has, there's something that is hooked to that that we've got to do also. That we also have to do. He says, um, the promise here is that if, if I will give you whatever you ask in prayer, if 
You what? Remain in me. Say, we can't be going off and living as the world during the week or come on Sunday up here to the altars and saying, oh God, help me. Say, that's not what he's talking about there. He's talking about the word of God abiding in you. He's talking about in sweet fellowship with him. Yes, there's times we get busy, but you know what? Life is busy. Deal with it. Make some adjustments that we keep him first because so many times in our lives we get so busy, God gets pushed off to the side. And then we grab God when we need him back in our game that we're trying to play here in life, the, this game called life that we think that, well, God, I'm okay now, so I'm going to put you back over here on the sideline, but when I need you, I'll let you know again. That's not where we're talking about remaining in the Lord. Amen. And we wonder why sometimes God is not hearing our prayers. Because what I call us is crisis Christians. They only need Jesus when it's convenient. Or they only need Jesus when they're in trouble. Saints, you need God on the high times, you need God in the low times. You need God in between the times. We need him all the time, saints. Yeah. We just don't need a God that we take him off the wall. He's not some genie in a bottle that we just rub his lamp going, like, okay, Lord, grant me my three wishes. That's not our God. Our God wants a very much a personal relationship with us in the good times, in the bad times, in whatever time you're going through in life. God wants to be there with you. So the starting point is you have to have an honest relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. Through the word, the Bible, that's why Bible study is so, so important. You're saying, well, Brother Rick, you're saying that if I don't study the word of God and if I don't be in Bible study, God's not going to hear me. I'm not saying that, but I tell you this, that the more you say in the word of God, the more that you hear the word of God, the more your prayers are going to line up with the word of God. Because so many times as we are, are, are praying to God, we are so out of God's will because we have not been in God's will. The word of God was teaching us and knowing exactly what we need for our lives because it's all in the Word of God. I have put on three questions on your outlines. and It'll be on the screens also. Three questions I want you quickly to evaluate yourself. If you're in an honest relationship with Jesus Christ right now, and maybe you are, and that's fine, but I just wanted you to evaluate yourself to see if we're in the honest relationship with God. The very first thing I want you to write down, and I was really kind of, I wasn't going to come see uh, Sister Mindy because Mindy is very good about wording things. And I said, well, no, I'll just try this on my own. But I put up here, if you put it on the screen here, do I or have I, okay, refuse to admit things that I have done wrong in the past? In other words, I'm talking about do I or have I refused? Saints, can I just say one word there? It's called pride. Pride is a nasty thing that will cut your prayer life, that will harm your relationship with Jesus Christ so quickly. I have found that I, if I talk to some people and I say, you know, when's the last time that you've repented of your sins? I, I, I don't know. It's amazing when I begin to um, talk to people and I say, how's your relationship with Jesus Christ? I mean, when's the last time you just did a, a self-examination and where you're at? Well, we just heard today a gentleman saying that uh, he has never sinned. I mean, he's, he's, he's arrived. Saints, none of us have arrived. None of us have arrived. We all have false. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. But the problem is, saints, we like to, try to, we try to, like to cover it up and not really talk to God about our sins, about the things that, Lord, that was wrong. I was being very selfish there. Lord, I was admitting to our sins. That's being in relationship with God. Just he already knows. But sometimes we try to think that if we don't talk about it, he's not going to know about it. It's kind of like what reminds me of like when Adam and Eve were in the garden. They're going like, Laura's going, Adam and Eve? You know, Adam, where are you? Well, he knows where they're at, you know. But sometimes we're the exact same way. We like to play hide and go seek with the Lord. Lord, you can't see me. You know, come find me. And God say, no, I want you to come find me. And let's deal with this. Let's confess your sins. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Time to get clean with the Lord. God already knows. He just wants you to confess it, that you can be right with him. Because God wants you to hear clearly. I love Psalm 68, 18 says that if I regard or if I cherish sin in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Look at that verse. It says, if I had not confessed the sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. Mm. Wow. Look at this next verse in Isaiah 59, 2. It says about our sins, our wrongness that separates us from God. It says, your sins that have cut you off from God. Mm. When I read that, it just put a, mm, in my spirit, I'm going like, Lord, it's literally cut us off. Because of your sins, you have turned away and will not listen anymore. Saints, God can't hang around sin. Yeah, yeah we, we all make mistakes. God loves us, but 
He's not going to, the Holy Spirit's only going to abide in us for so long. If we're going to continue living in sin and going our own way, God's going to say, fine, have your own way. It'll come to that point where, hey, I'm done. I can do no more. You've hardened your heart so much. Say so with your heart become that place. Stay soft. Stay close to God. Lord, is there anything? If you begin to, I, I believe it was one time, Sister Beth, she made a comment back at Mount Hope back years ago. I didn't say the church name, but she said, she said, just try it just once. Just say, Holy Spirit, put your finger on anything in my life that does not belong there. Look out. You're going to say, okay, Lord, slow down. I'm not as perfect as I thought I was. I, I guess I do got some issues still. Saints, we all do. We all got some problems. And once we all do that, I'm going like, okay, Lord, the spotlight's on me now. But that's good because I need to know what's going on here because I want to be right with the Lord. Proverbs 28, 13 says, He who tries to conceal his sins cannot prosper, but he who admits them, confesses them, forsakes them, will have mercy. Woo! Praise yeah. God. So what do you do? Well, 1 John 1, 8 says, If we claim to be without sin, <laughs> we're just deceiving ourselves. The truth is not in us. However, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to what? Forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Wow. Confession is simply just being honest with God. God, I messed up. I was wrong. Forgive me. Let's make the reconnection here. I don't want to live in sin. I want to be right with you, Lord. Number, the second question you need to ask is this. Am I currently in the presently ignoring any of God's principles? God has spoke to you about some things in your life. Maybe it's about tithing. Maybe it's about forgiving. Maybe it's about letting some things go over your path. But you're saying, no, Lord, I'm not ready to do that. No, Lord. And God is saying, I have some principles that I want you to abide by. And you're refusing to do that. Saints, you're, you're, you're being disobedient. And when you're being disobedient, God is saying, listen to me. If you won't listen to me, then I'm not going to listen to you. You know, I play this game on our buses uh, many times. We have students on there that don't like to listen to the bus driver because we're driving the bus. So when they say to me, Mr. Rogers, would you turn the heat off, please? I'll ignore them. And they go, Mr. Rogers, why are you ignoring me for it? I said, why are you ignoring me for it? When I ask you to sit down and be good, or if I ask and you continue to do that, how does that make you feel? It gets them thinking, I'm going, but the Lord reminded me, we do the exact thing to the Lord. We expect the Lord to listen to us, but when it comes time, God's saying, why should I listen to you if you're not going to listen to me? It's a two-way street, saints. 1 John chapter 3, 21 through 22 says this. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have, uh, we have confidence before God that we receive from him anything we ask. That's the promise. But listen, because we obey his commands and do what pleases him, this is his command, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he has commanded us. God's really been dealing with me. Some people bought food. Some people bought Diet Coke. God's been dealing with me about loving. Just loving people, accepting people for where they are. Not to judge, but to love. And that's my conviction, right? That's what God's dealing with me on. Stop looking at people and judging them because you know what I'm finding to be true after 44 years. The way you judge somebody, saints, is the way that you're going to be judged. And I don't want to go through that anymore. And I, I think it's a constant circle, but I said, Lord, this time I want to get it right. <laughs> you know, if not, you're going to go on that mountain again. You're going to go on that mountain again. I've been on this mountain about four or five times, but it's so easy for, how us, for us to kind of drift away and kind of forget about that, and we get kind of caught up. And, and really what we're doing is we're trying to cut somebody else down and make ourselves feel better about ourselves. When I hear people start cutting me down or making fun of me or whatever, you know, I'm, I'm thinking like, hmm, okay, you must have a problem with their self-esteem. Are you having a bad day? Are you feeling bad about yourself? Are you feeling bad about your weight now? Because you're really picking about how fat I am. You know, and really, truly, you're about four times bigger than I, I wouldn't say that, you know, but, <laughs> but, you know, I'm thinking, like, I can really come back here, but I'm going, are you having a problem with your weight today? Because you're really picking on my weight. You know what I'm saying? And it's all out of fun and games, but you kind of wonder sometimes really what's going on in their heart. You know? So you say, how can I... How can I keep all God's commands? Nobody's perfect. No, nobody's perfect. How is he ever going to answer all my prayers and then if I'm not perfect? See, God doesn't demand perfection, saints. He demands obedience. He demands obedience. See, an obedience is an attitude. Mm, I, I think I talk about attitude every time I come up here. I don't know why. But, you know, attitude is everything. And how, Pastor said a few minutes ago, how you give your tithe with the right attitude, with a joyful heart. If you're doing it that way, God says there's a blessing. I tie, there's blessing. There's so many, but attitude is everything. 
You know, if I was to tell my son, I remember back, geez, I have two boys. You know, if I was to tell my four-year-old son, Logan, Logan, I need to go clean your room, please. And he goes in there, and, and uh, I go in there a half hour later, and his room's half done. I mean, there's still stuff hanging from the dresser and from the ceiling fan. And, you know, but he's just kind of sitting there kind of like, hmm, you know, four years old. Would I be upset with him? No. Because at least I know he had the right attitude that he was trying to make a difference. He was trying to get it accomplished. But as a four-year-old, they did the best that he could. And his attention span only lasted for so long. But if I was to walk in there after a half hour later and he's not done not a single thing, would I be upset? Yes, because he went in with the wrong attitude. And he didn't make any kind of attempt to do anything that was right. The same thing is true with us saints. We all have our, our weaknesses. We all have our blemishes. And God's saying, you know what? At least you're trying to make an effort here. And I'm going to meet you right where you're at. You know, many times I've spoken over the years, especially the issue of tithing. And I'm not going to talk about tithing tonight, saints. I mean, I might have mentioned here and there. But, uh, you know, one thing that me and my wife did when we were just starting off as baby Christians, walking with the Lord, um, we started off, our, our, our tithe back then was 30 bucks, and that was a killer. I'm going, oh, dear God, how are we going to do this? You know, and we started off with five dollars one week. Then the next week we went to six dollars. And then one week we jumped to ten dollars. It was amazing by the fourth week. I'm not saying that the fourth week is a magic number. But God met us where we were at. And we began to see God's promises and his faithfulness. And we was able to almost increase immediately. I'm going like, Lord. We began to see our bills come back on time. We began to see, have extra money that I'm going like, Lord, what's going on here? And we, we'd fall backwards again and we'd quit tithing. And next we know it's our bills started going backwards. And we'd have less money left over. And, and we'd start tithing again. We'd, see our, we'd start seeing God's hand again. God will meet you right where you're at, saints. Yeah. Wherever you're at. Number three. Question number three, do I really want God's will for my life? Write that down. Do I really want God's will for my life? Because you know what? I think sometimes we want our own will for our life. We want our own plan, our own agenda. God, I want to go here. God, I want to go there. But God is saying, no, I want you right where you're at. First John chapter 5, verse 14 says this. This is the assurance that we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to whose will? His will. Not my will, not pastor's will, but his will. He hears us, and if we know that he hears us, then whatever we ask, we know and we have what we asked him for. Yeah. Mm. See, when we ask according to God's will, it's going to happen. But if it's not God's will, saints, it's not going to happen. And, but can you imagine if God answered every one of our prayers? We would be either spoiled rotten brats or we would be in a world of mess. Because our selfish agenda is saying, I mean, I can imagine my kids, I mean, I can just hear, Ryan want every gun in the city, you know, I mean, every gun that he can think of, and, and his home hunting land, and my, old, my youngest son, and the, the fastest vehicles, and I could just hear it going on and out. We'd be spoiled rotten brats. So I thank God that he doesn't answer all our prayer requests because he sees the big picture. We only see what's in front of us, but God sees down the road. So when I look back, and going like, thank you, Lord, for not answering that prayer request. You know, I mean, thank you, Lord, that there's some prayers he does not answer. Woo, thank you, Jesus. Don't get mad at God. God's looking out for your best. He's looking out for you. <laughs> you know, most Christians make the mistake, well, God, if it's your will. Well, God, if it's your will. If you're walking in God's will, it is God's will. Because whatever is, if your heart is in the right place with God, it's not going to be selfish, saints. It's going to be about others. It's going to be about others. It's not about what you can get, but what you can do with what you have. I like how St. Augustine said this. He said, love God and do what you want. And I read that, and I'm going like, well, that's kind of crazy, but you really think about it. If you really, truly love God and you're close to him, you're automatically going to flow in that direction anyways. It's going to be all right. I'm going like, Lord, I like that. And it's good, but it's, it's true. So the first condition to answer prayer is this, that you have to have an honest relationship with God. Number two, you must have a forgiving attitude towards other people. All oh, forgiveness is key, saints, to having God answer prayers. Mark chapter 11, verses 24 to 25, talks about this. He says, therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you receive it, and it will be yours. Here's the condition. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, anything against anyone, forgive him. So the Father in heaven may also forgive you. One of the most other characteristics in the Bible besides faith and prayer is forgiveness. Saints, if you're not right down here, it's not going to be right this way either. 
Whatever is happening horizontal has happened vertical. Saints, God's not going to answer your prayer if you're holding bitterness, grudges in your heart. Why? Because we know we pray that prayer in the Lord's Prayer. Father, uh, uh, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us our day, our daily bread. Forgive us as we forgive those who trespass against us. Do we really want to pray that prayer? When I went through the series down the road, I, we did that series, and I said, we really want to pray that prayer today. Father, forgive us as much as we forgive other people. Ooh. We want God's forgiveness, do we not? Yeah. Forgiveness is the key that gets us, is actually the bridge that gets us across. God forgave us before we were even yet born. In Matthew 5. Jesus gives a sermon on the mount, and he says that when you go stand in a church and you realize that you have ought against a brother, I remember one time that I was going to take communion, and we had a, a major division in the church at one time, the very first year, and I was a knucklehead. Can anybody say knucklehead? I mean, I was a knucklehead. I didn't know what I was doing, and I stepped on some people's toes, and I hurt their feelings, and I knew I did, and, and I was up here getting ready to do communion, and, and the Lord just convicted me, and I'm going like, I gotta take care of this right now. And I said, church, just hold on. I went out to the front porch and I made a phone call and I and I, I apologized. And I said, I am so sorry that I hurt you. I'm a human being. Would you please forgive me? They said, yes. They said, yes. Then I was able to come back in the doors and I was able to get things right. And that's what Jesus was talking about in Matthew chapter 5. He says that when you go to church and you're getting ready to offer your gift to the Lord, it may be your tithe. Maybe you're offering, whatever it is you're offering to the Lord, and you remember that you got something against somebody, and they got me something against you, stop. Go take care of it, then come back and bring your gift to God. How important is that, saints, to God, as it should be much as important as it is to us? Why? Because God says you can't say you love God and hate your brother. One of the primary reasons why people never see answers to prayer is because they allow bitterness to spring up in their lives. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15, the Living Bible says, Watch out that no bitterness take root among you, for as it springs up among you, it takes deep trouble, hurting many, we're at saints, in their spiritual lives, in your prayer walk, saints, in your spiritual life. It does damage. Bitterness is like poison. So what do you do? What do you, what do you pray every time you pray the Lord's Prayer as I said a moment ago? Father, forgive us as we forgive those who trespass against us. Do we really want to pray that tonight? If you're saying, ooh, then you got some things in your life that you're saying, Lord, we need to deal with tonight. Before I go to bed, we need to deal with this because I want my prayers answered. I want to be right with you. But also it goes on. The scripture of the Bible says, husbands in the same way, just like you talked about the wives previously in a previous verse, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect so nothing will hinder your prayers. I mean, there's been times where I've wanted to go and get in prayer, but me and my wife have had a tiff. And I knew that if I didn't go get things right, God was not going to listen to me. And that goes for wives with their husbands. If you know that you've been in a tip, you know how hard it is for me to go get in prayer when we just had an argument or something is not right? No, no. I'm going to go back and make this right so I can come to the Lord because something's not right in here. If I'm not right with her, then there's a problem. I can't pray. I can't worship. I can't even preach. we got to make things right. But what's interesting for me was... The devil just loved to, in the very beginning when I found his tactics out, maybe it was for you too, on your way to church. Isn't it interesting how you and your spouse can get into it? I mean, we're talking right out next door, I'm walking through the doors, oh, praise the Lord. My wife gets so mad at me when I do that. I'm going like, hey, thank you, Jesus. Oh, I'm highly blessed. And she's dragging the kids behind her, you know. <laughs> and she gets so mad at me because I knew it would grind her, so that's why I get her back. I'm going like, hey, ain't bringing that in the church. We'll leave that in the car, you know. And, uh, but uh it affected our prayer life and it affected our worship because I knew that things weren't right. But so our plans was we'd get as late as possible. Nobody talk to anybody, eat our food, and get to church. <laughs> and it worked for years. <laughs> we would not give the devil any space. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> You gotta figure out some sneaky attacks, you know, and just keep your mouth shut and just go. You know. Honey, is this, does this make me look fat? Mm, I say nothing, just go. Yeah, I know what I'm saying. But we gotta make sure we're right with our spouses and uh, make sure we keep the devil out of there also. The third one is this, saints. If you're taking notes, you must be willing to share the results. Listen, saints, God wants to receive all the glory when he answers prayer. If you're not willing to share it, then what's the point? What is the, God wants you to be an encouragement. See, there's a principle, what you sow is what you reap. Give and it will be given to you. It's a principle of generosity. And the more you give out, the more that God gives to you. 
Hello? The more you give, the more you receive. The less you give, the less you receive. The same thing is true with prayer, saints. See, if you expect God to bless your life, you must be willing to bless others' lives with the same benefits that God's blessed you with. Those things are not just for you. They're for you to be a blessing to other people, not to hoard. Proverbs 21, 13 says this, If a man shuts his ears to the cry of the poor, he too will cry out and not be answered. Oh, man. How many, how many times have you walked past somebody, you know, uh, at Walmart? As of one time that I, I, I did that, I walked past him and I said, Sir, would you buy a Tootsie Roll for an hour to help a, 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 a child? And I said, No, not today. And I kept on walking and I just got, I'm going like a buck. A buck, what is wrong with you, Rogers? But I was on my, my, uh, my slim time, what do you want to call that, lean time, where I was losing some weight. I'm going like, no, that's of the devil. You know, but I'm thinking, Lord, I can bless somebody else with that chocolate. And I went back and I actually gave him five bucks. And I said, here, pff, you know, God bless you. Just being obedient, there was a situation where God convicted me. He said, let's do this. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 22 we read the verse that says this, that we receive from him anything we ask because we obey his commands. What are his commands? The next verse says this. His commands are believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ. Love one another as he has commanded us. He says that we keep his commands. Keep his commands. I love that. It's by loving each, other, loving each other. What is he talking about? In verse 17, he says, If anybody has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Mm. One of the ways we prove that we love God is by the way we share with what we have, giving what we have. See, we are a channel. God wants to use us. And if we got a bunch of junk in our trunk and a bunch of unforgiveness and grudges and everything else going on, God said, I can't flow through that. How I get through it, it's going to be like, it's kind of like your cell signal. It's like, hello, can you hear me now? But as we get closer to the tower, you know, closer to Jesus, things become more clearly, don't they? As we get the, 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 uh, the obstacles out of the way. I like that. That happens. In James chapter 4, verse 1, it says, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from the desires that battle within you? You want something, but you don't get it. Boy, sounds like a bunch of men. I mean, <clears throat> uh, young men. I was once that way. I'd get upset, I'd throw a fix, I couldn't get my latest gadget. But you kill and you covet. I never did that. <laughs> I never killed anybody. <laughs> I didn't probably kick the dog. No, I didn't do that either. I, I love my dogs. But you can't have what you want. You quarrel and you fight, but you have not because you do not ask God. Give us another reason why our prayers are hindered. Look at here. When you ask, you don't receive because you ask with the wrong motives that you may spend it on what you get on your own pleasures. He's saying motives is so important. Are you asking God for something that's going to, oh, it's going to bless me? Or are you saying, God, I want this so that I can be a blessing? Because everything we have belongs to the Lord. I think we forget that sometimes, that that gallon of milk in the refrigerator belongs to the Lord, and that car you drive belongs to the Lord, and everything that you have belongs to the Lord. It's not yours. And God said, I'm giving these things to be a blessing to other people, to, to help them, to bless them. See, God is not interested in simply satisfying our selfishness. God wants to give you your wants. He wants to bless you. But you want to give your children their wants. God wants to do that too. But God doesn't want a bunch of spoiled, rotten kids either. He wants ones that are patient, that are loving, that are kind. They're not getting upset with each other because they can't get what they want. Number four. I'll read your verse first. In James chapter 1, verse 5 through 7, it says, If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. He said, if you need wisdom, ask. How many times is our pride that we say, uh, we got this figured out, Lord. We can handle this. But if you really think about it for a second, saints, we'd be much smarter to ask the one who has all the wisdom and say, okay, Lord, I need some wisdom here to get through this. I need some advice here. I need some help here. You don't have to convince him. He wants to give it to you freely. Verse 6 says, But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like the wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. The man that does not think that he will receive anything from the Lord, he is double-minded man, unstable in all that he does. So the fourth condition to answer prayer is this. Write this down. You must believe God will answer. You must believe that God, if you're just going to ask God, well, yeah, we'll see if he does or not. 
don't expect God to answer, but if you come expecting in the house of God to hear from him through the pastor or maybe through somebody else or maybe through the worship time or if you come to get before God and say, God, I need some answers. God's not going to leave you hanging, saints. He might not give you the answer right then and there, but the answer's coming. But you've got to come expecting to hear from God. If you're not expecting, might as well forget about it because God said, hey, if your, expect- if your expectancy is that low, I'm not going to waste my time. But when we begin to believe God for answers, things begin to happen. Yeah. See, you must expect God to answer. To answer that prayer. It may be yes, it may be no, it may be maybe. It's like, hey, either way. But God will answer you. In some way, shape, or form, you just got to listen to his voice, hear him. Mark chapter 9, verse 29 says this, According to your faith, not Pastor Rick's faith, not Brother Rick's faith, not your spouse's faith, but according to your faith, it will be done unto you. Mm, that is a good verse. You wonder why. What are we expecting God to do in your life? What are you expecting him to do in your life tonight? Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 says this, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Wow. So you can't even please God if you don't even have faith. It's a number one. Here we go. A prerequisite. I wanted to use a different word, but I use it anyways. In life is to have faith. So what is faith? Is faith believing that God can do it? Well, that's not really faith, saints. Well, I believe God, God do it. God can do it if you believe it or not. Well, I believe that God might do it. No. Do I believe that God will? Yeah. That's faith. I believe that my God will. That can move mountains, saints. I believe that my God will. Faith is not a desire. Some people think, well, I have a tremendous amount of desire in me. No. That's not going to do it either, saints. See, I just believe that God actually answers some people's prayers that if they did answer, they probably have heart attacks. So thank God that God hasn't answered your prayer because you're going like, oh, he answered my prayer, you know, and God is keeping you alive because he hasn't answered your prayer because it'd probably really freak you out. Whoa! But God does. You know, so many times God answers prayer, we don't even realize it, but it comes in, and, but it comes in a way that you don't even see it coming. You're going like, God, did I pray for patience? Why am I getting no patience? Oh, geez, wow, why am I, why am I going through the storm for it? Well, because you prayed for patience. You know, it's not always how you think it's going to come. You know what I'm saying? We've all been there. We've all been kind of ignorant of God's word and done some crazy things and like, well, that was stupid. You know, Lord, I pray for understanding. <laughs> you know. <laughs> oh. So if God doesn't answer, that's his problem because you've done what the Bible says. See, if you plant a seed in the ground in a few months, it sprouts up, I get a tomato plant. All right. Is that a miracle? No. It's simply just following the laws, um, following the rules of the, of that God has already placed in order. So when you plant that seed, expect something to come up, good or bad, whatever it may be. Number five, last but not least. Let me read you a verse first here in John chapter 14. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that your, the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. The fifth condition to answer prayer is you must pray in Jesus' name. We must pray in Jesus' name. John chapter 16, verse 24, he says that, he says the same thing. He says, you not ask anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. Woo! So the fifth condition for answer prayer is you must pray in Jesus' name. I don't care if you pray it in the beginning or at the end. We need to be saying in Jesus' name. Lord, we ask that you will be done or whatever it may be. Because we need to be specific who we're talking to. So what is so special about Jesus' name? Just for a few moments here. Honestly, for a long time, I had, I had no idea. You know, growing up in a church, I heard it so many times, I thought it was like the, the magic password that opened, the, opened heaven. I had so many different ideas as a child. When I heard that, I'm going like, oh, there's something you should do. There's something you put on the tagline and not really understanding what amen even meant. So be it. And as you being understand, I'm going like, well, it's kind of like almost like a CB signal, like, Roger, Roger, Tim, buddy, you know, I mean, no. We're, <laughs> you know, you begin to think of these things as a child, but you're, as a child, you, you kind of grow up as an adult and thinking, wait a minute, those are childish thoughts that I've had that I believed all these years, but really, why do we say in Jesus' name for? So what in the world does it mean in Jesus' name? What does it mean? I heard a story, let me give you a quick illustration here. A pastor friend I know took a son and 14 friends of his uh, sons to a carnival. 
and uh, it was for his birthday party, and he bought a row of tickets for him, his son. And, and as uh, the father was standing there, the, all the, the, his friends were lining up and getting on the rides. And a little while later, another boy was standing there, and he's going like, are you my son's friend? And he goes, no. Then why should I give you a ticket? Because your son said you would. And he gave him a ticket to let him get on. The point of the illustration is this, saints. I don't have, the, I mean, I don't have the, um, the right to get answered prayers from God, but what makes me think that I should get prayers to be answered because God doesn't owe me anything. Did you hear me? God doesn't owe us anything at all, but we think God owes us everything, and we don't. See, I owe him a lot more than he ever owes me anything. When I come to pray and ask God for results, I don't ask him for merit, but I ask for the merit of Christ. I come to him because Jesus Christ is the one that I'm going to. He's the one who's interceding for us. But so many times we think that Jesus Christ owes us everything, and when we don't, we owe him everything. So if he never answers another prayer, so be it. He's God. We are not. God's in control. See, Jesus is the bridge between God and man. God came in the form of man, Jesus Christ. And the Bible says there's one mediator. There's one bridge between God and man. He just said, I am the way and the truth and the life. That no one comes to the Father except through me. He's the bridge. He is the bridge. So it's always necessary to say the word in Jesus' name at the end of a prayer. I don't think it's really totally necessary in the sense that you say it in the middle, the end, or the beginning. Just refer to God as in Jesus' name. Seal that bugger up with the blood of Jesus. Seal it up to who you're talking to. Everyone just bow your heads just for a moment here as we're going to close in prayer. But I want to ask you just a few questions as a, as a review and just something between you and the Lord. Which of these conditions have you been overlooking tonight? Maybe that's why you're not getting prayers answered as you was hoping to be getting them answered. Maybe you're holding a grudge. Maybe you're here tonight and you're nursing resentment and you have a lot of bitterness to build up in your life. It's no wonder that you're not hearing any prayers being answered. Or maybe you're refusing to admit there's some wrong in your life and you got some pride there saying, well, you know, it was only just, it was only a candy bar or it was only this, Lord. It's no big deal. But in God's eyes, it's a big deal. He wants you to come clean, that you can feel clean. We think that Watergate was a cover-up, but it's nothing compared to some of the things we try to cover up on God. So we say, God, I just admit to that tonight. I want to come clean with you, God, tonight. Lord, I want to, I want to get rid of that stuff that I'm trying to hide. Kind of like Adam and Eve trying to hide in the garden. But God, you already know. I want to come clean tonight. I want to get that taken care of. Maybe you prayed that, and you never really expected God ever to answer. Well, God, if it's your will, you know, it'll happen. If it's your will. Never really believe in God for anything at all, but your faith is just kind of like, yeah, well, if it happens, it happens. Or maybe you're unwilling to share God's blessing with other people. Maybe you've been hesitant to give back to God a percentage of all the things that he's blessed you with. You must be willing to share your benefits with other people. Or maybe you have not been abiding in him. Maybe you've been living your life during the week and not really living for God, and you've allowed your, your walk and your talk to kind of slide, and your prayer life is kind of like, yeah, I'll pray when I need to. Right now things are going kind of good. When things start getting bad, then we start crying with Jesus. Help me, I'm sinking, Lord. That's not abiding in Christ. Christ wants to be God all the time. I don't know where you're at in your walk with the Lord today. Maybe you're going through a storm right now, and and it's kind of scary, and, and right now it's usually in those times where we usually are crying out to God, but maybe you're on top of the mountain right now, and, and you're just praising Jesus because everything is going so good, but my question is, where's your walk with him right now? Is he still right there by your side? Are you still praising along with Jesus, or are you just praising along with yourself and, and what you've accomplished? See, you can't pray in Jesus' name unless you know him as a friend, as you know him as a Savior, as you know him as Lord, as a director of your life. The most important question is, do you have an honest relationship with God? Only you can answer it. I'm not talking about church membership, saints. I'm talking about a relationship with the living God. Through communication, through his word, through prayer, through worship, through our actions, through our attitudes. Oh, where are you tonight? Are you standing off in the distance saying, Lord, I've, I've done too much. Lord, how could you ever forgive me? Don't believe the lie of the enemy. God wants to set you free tonight. He's saying, just come to me. Come to me, you are weary and heavy and burdened. I want to give you rest. 
but pride's holding you back, saying, oh, Lord, Lord, I can handle this. I got this, Lord. Just stand back. I want to encourage you tonight to let it go. Say, God, help me. I've been the God of my own life. I want you to be God of my life. Father, as we are all examining our hearts tonight, Lord, and even, Father, as I've been preparing this message, Lord, and just pondering some things in my own life, Lord, some things that I've got to fine-tune, some things that I've got to do, but, Lord, I can't do it on my own, Lord. I, gotta need, I need your help, Holy Spirit. I need your help. Lord, none of us can do anything on our own, Lord. God, if we try, Lord, we're just going to fail. But, Lord, with your help, it is possible because, Lord, you want to restore and you want to answer prayer, Father, but we've got to do some things ourselves, Father. And, Lord, I believe as we begin to take the first step in that direction, Lord, you're going to meet us right where we are at. Maybe it's unforgiveness. And you're going, Lord, how can I ever forgive that person that hurt me? You know, it's interesting in our families, Lord, that we get hurt the most by moms and pas and our kids and but, Lord, I pray that tonight that we be a night of we just let go and say, God, I'm letting down the rope. Lord, I'm, I'm going to choose forgiveness. It's not worth the battle anymore. I've been in those shoes. I fought that battle for two years myself, my own father. Saying, I realized it was pride. Neither one of us are going to budge because we knew both of us were right. But you know what? Neither one of us were right. And I finally said, you know what? I give up. I forgive you. You hurt me. I hurt you. Let's stop this. And experience a new rest and a new peace. And maybe some of you are here tonight in that same battle with maybe a, a, a relative or a friend or whatever. Put the rope down. Stop the tug of war. You're just wearing yourself out. Father, I pray tonight, Lord, for anyone here tonight, Lord, and I believe there's many here. Tonight. I believe they're here tonight. Each one that's here tonight, Father, is dealing with something probably in their life right now, Lord, that they're going like, yep, that's me, Lord. Yep, that. Lord, you're hearing those yups. You're hearing those tonight, Lord, and you're saying they're waiting on you. God's waiting on you to make the first move. Did you hear me? God is waiting on you to make the first move. He wants to meet you. Father, I pray right now, Lord, as each one of us even tonight are just examining our lives, saying, Lord, what are these five areas, Father God, in my life? Which one of these? Maybe they're all five. I don't know, Lord, but Father, I pray that we begin to take some baby steps saying, God, help. Father, you hear that prayer. You hear the prayer of surrender. You hear the prayer saying, God, I need your help. I've got myself into a mess. God will answer that prayer. He will answer the sinner's prayer, the cry for salvation. He wants to answer some prayers tonight. Father, I pray tonight, Lord. Father, tonight would be a time of healing and restoration with the Father. Lord, that we will not walk around, Father God, with wounds and, and unforgiveness and hurt and resentment and pride and all these things that like to try to attach ourselves to us. But Father, we're going to say, Lord, I surrender to you tonight, Lord. And Lord, I'm giving it all to you. My finances, my relational, whatever it is, Lord, I can't do it anymore. <laughs> and God, that's when the breakthrough happens. <laughs> that's when the breakthrough begins to happen. Because God, you've got to get our attention sometimes to bring us to this point. To say something's wrong. Mayday, mayday, something is wrong. Father, help us to keep you in the boat. That we don't sink our ship, but Father God, we keep you in our ship. And we keep ourselves, Father God, connected to you in prayer. Father, we love you and we praise you. And all God's people said, amen. amen. A quiet group tonight, but God is here. His anointing was here, and, and I thank you. Thank you, Pastor Rick, for the opportunity. Good word. Come on, give the Lord a praise.